Can you hear me in the back now? That's better? Okay, talk right into the mic. Great, thank you. Uh, well, it's really nice to see everyone come out this evening. I myself have, this is my first visit to Cafe Scientifique, although I know some colleagues at Auckland University who have spoken here before. Um, as you can tell from my accent, I'm from North America. I'm actually a Californian. I just went there for the first time in three years and saw my 99-year-old mother and went also to Yellowstone National Park for field work, looking at life in extreme environments here in New Zealand, in Australia, in many parts of the world, Argentina, um, trying to see if we can narrow down the search for life somewhere else in the solar system. So I am a geologist. I'm also a paleontologist. And I'm an astrobiologist. And so everything's sort of come together here in my 25 years in New Zealand uh, to really focus on how it is that we search for life elsewhere. And before we kind of launch into that, I wanted to step back and just say a few words about why we would want to do that. Why is it important to look for life elsewhere? I mean, isn't it good enough here? We've got enough problems here. Shouldn't we be focusing? on the problems here at, at home. And surely we should be focusing on the problems here at home, but humans, um, as corny as it sounds, we've been exploring you know, Earth for thousands of years, and people feel like we've looked at most corners of the Earth, and we look up to the stars, we've been looking up to the stars since millennia, and humans have all been asking the same question, are we the only ones here? And uh, a long time ago, the Greeks just assumed we weren't the only ones here, that there were loads of other planets out there, and they were right. But for a while there, if you said something like that, particularly during the time of the Inquisition, a little later on, you'd get killed for it. And there are definitely astronomers and others uh, who were. Um, if we sort of fast forward up to more closer to the present day, um, we assumed before we started sending probes to space that Mars had canals, and Martians, and that the, uh, the environment on Venus was nice and mild. We were wrong about all of it. <laughs> I think they were very disappointed when the first flybys went past and they realized that Mars in particular was dead and cold and dry and well, Venus is crushing and hot and has a runaway greenhouse. So it's a super interesting question, you know, why uh, have we ended up being in the Goldilocks zone? You know, not too hot, not too cold. And are we the only ones now that we're finding extra solar planets everywhere else? Thousands of them, more than 5,000 now. One of my colleagues at Auckland University, Nick Rattenbury, studies exoplanets. And uh, next week we'll be giving a guest lecture in my astrobiology course, which we just launched three years ago at Auckland University. And now have more than 200 general education students from all around the campus. And mostly actually engineers who are just dying to get out there and get jobs in the new space industry that has come to New Zealand shores, thanks initially to Rocket Lab, but now there are many, many companies. And so your children or your grandchildren are going to have options to work in space that we never had before in New Zealand. Uh, so my job is to uh, inspire students to think about what it means, the question, are we alone? And regardless of all the problems we have right here at home, I feel it's kind of my, um, my, my real um, destiny to get students to really think beyond you know, what's right in front of them. Because in the end, when anybody sees the Earth from space, we all know how fragile this planet really is. And our chances of surviving on this planet, well eventually, 300 million years from now anyway, this planet will begin its runaway greenhouse. And we, if we're still around, we certainly are gonna have to get off of Earth and maybe move out to Mars as our sun, the brightness of our sun keeps going and going. We are going to have to move eventually if we don't wipe ourselves out first. So there are a couple different ways to look for life. There's the life that you can look for with telescopes that's outside the solar system. My focus is more in planetary science because of my background in geology. And you go to other planets and what do they have but loads of rocks. And most people I know think that a rock is a rock. Is a rock. But it turns out rocks are extremely exciting and that's another thing I like to do and inspire my students around is to really work with rocks, um, act like you're driving a rover. Uh, I get them to write science mission proposals. Um, they also present all kinds of interesting um, art pieces or videos, especially the art students. 
um, or, and the engineers like to um, design rovers. So we do all these things in class to get us thinking about um, what, it, what it would be like to try to narrow down that search. Was there ever life, for example, in our own solar system? We want to start there first. It's just right next door. And my specialty area is Mars, um, but I'm also very interested in uh, the possibility that life could be beyond what we call a Goldilocks zone, not too hot, not too cold. And we have to think about the history of planets and moons through time because their habitability, whether they've got enough liquid water for life, and some of that life might just be microbial life or bacteria in the solar system because we don't have any signs of intelligent life in our solar system. And we're certainly listening for signs from outside the solar system. That's what SETI does, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. And we're working to try to get um, and, and, and satellite office of SETI here in Auckland. We're really hoping that will happen. We are working hard to get that to happen, but COVID got a little bit in the way of that. However, so there's the listening for extraterrestrials, intelligence, there's looking for signs of intelligence outside our solar system, and then within our solar system, we're looking for life of the, of the primitive kind. Um, because life evolved on Earth four billion years ago when things got cool enough, and we had liquid oceans, uh, and things weren't quite so hot, there weren't so many meteorite impacts coming from the early formation of the solar system. And that's the time when life took off. And the big question is, was it easy for it to take off or was it difficult? And most scientists I know who work in prebiochemistry or um, geology or paleontology or, or biochemistry think that it might have been pretty easy. But we still can't make life in a test tube from scratch as yet. So there are people working top down on the problem and there are people working bottom up on the problem. And my particular area is to go and narrow, if you're thinking of looking for life like a needle in a haystack, and planets are pretty big, then you want to narrow down that scope. And the way we do that is to look for what we call extreme environments on Earth, the limits of life on Earth, the hottest life, the coldest life, the saltiest life, the most acidic life, because at those limits, is where we then can ask the big questions of could there have been life on the moons of Jupiter and Saturn? It's very, very cold there, but there are liquid oceans underneath the ice of those moons. And they're geysering into space, just like our geysers here in New Zealand. So there are teams of people at NASA and the European Space Agency are going to be sending probes out to those moons in the coming years. There are Mars rovers, of course, roving the planet. And the other thing that hopefully I'll get to talk to you more about is our own mission which is an Australian, New Zealand, Japanese, American mission um, to go and get samples on Mars and bring them back to look for life in those uh, fossil life in those samples. And why, uh, why we're doing that, I'd like to tell you more about that in, in a few minutes. Um, but we pitched our mission to NASA. We got up to number three. And then in 2018, they chose a different kind of extreme environment, a different environment where they thought they might find life. And, uh, but we're still working on our mission. And the last kind of intro, because I'm giving you just a few intro thoughts, the last thing I want to kind of put in your mind is that we all rely on the, the Japanese Space Agency, JAXA, or the European Space Agency, ESA, or NASA, uh, to, for big missions of the past. But the new wave that's happening that New Zealand can get involved with is that missions are becoming more um, streamlined, they're becoming less big and unruly, and uh, industry is now getting involved. Not just Elon Musk trying to send humans to Mars, but um, all kinds of other missions. And Rocket Lab just announced in the last few months uh, a partnership with Harvard University to go to Venus and look for life in the clouds of Venus. So life may not be down on the planet where it's very nasty, but it might have migrated up as Venus got worse and worse, as our sun got hotter and hotter, and all the water evaporated into the atmosphere. And so they're actually going to search for life in the clouds of Venus, green clouds, they call them. And so our vision is to involve uh, companies and schools and um, in space agencies and academics and um, to, to envision how we might be able to find life version 2.0. So um, that's kind of, so we're very actively working on that right now with our students and with our colleagues on a mission called Life Springs. That's um, uh, engineered here in New Zealand and out of Japan. So I'm very excited about that. And um, the implications are that we study not only the origin of life on Earth to try to help us understand 
where life might be somewhere else. But we also look in these extreme environments to see if maybe that's the place where life is lurking somewhere in the solar system. Maybe under the ice in Mar Mars because the surface conditions today are so dry and hostile. And so, um, and that gets people thinking like, if we don't find life on Mars, is that a failure? And I would say no, that's really exciting too because it should be there. Mars used to be warm, it used to be wet, volcanoes used to spew, and when you mix volcanoes and water, you get heat and hot springs, and our hot springs here on Earth are jammed full of microbial life. If you go to any of our hot springs here in New Zealand and you walk around, or Yellowstone, all those colors you see, most of those colors are microbes adapted to high temperature, or acidity, or high alkalinity. And so Mars has similar deposits, which is a little picture uh, of some New Zealand deposits that look just like the ones on Mars that we like to go to and scoop up with our rover or our drone, bring them back to labs on Earth where we can actually um, really study them because a rover can't do what you need to do on Earth labs. So NASA's in a different location. The last thing I want to mention, they're in, um, they are in Jezero Crater right now. The mission that they chose was to go to a delta, which is where a river goes out into a lake. And out on the edge of those deltas underwater, um, where the finest sediment settles out, that's where a lot of organics get attracted to those very fine, muddy sediments. And what did they find in the last few weeks but organics? But organic molecules are not the same as life. We need the building blocks of life, which are made out of carbon or organic molecules, but that's not the same as the spark of life. So we'll see what they find, but they're going to be sampling that material and bringing it back. And we're hoping that in our uh, mission, which is to go look for ancient hot springs on Mars in a different place called uh, Columbia Hills, where, where Spirit Rover used to be in the 2000s. That's where we want to go back. I always like to say that NASA is like Captain Kirk at Star Trek, and they want to go to the next frontier in the new planet, and we're more like Mr. Spock, and we want to go back with our tricorder to a place we've been to before and learn more and bring back those samples and see if life actually uh, may have evolved on Mars. So that's part of, or part of the story of what some of what we're working on. So I thought um, maybe that's enough of an entree. So there's, I'm happy to talk about other things like I'm, I'm a geologist, but I'm happy to talk about some of the exciting things around James Webb or the DART mission. But I might only know as much as you do about some of those missions. But on the other hand, I guess what, what is exciting about all of that is that solar system exploration is alive and well. And it's nice to have New Zealand be a part of that. I think we should be a part of it. Um, and Rocket Lab itself is going into large rockets and planning to go to Mars. So we want to make sure our, our students are trained and are able to um, participate, not just have foreigners come in and help Rocket Lab get to the stars. So that's what we're hoping. We haven't pitched the mission to them yet, so shh, it's not ready yet. But our mission is very close. We have the engineering very close, and we're working on the sample, um, the sampling mechanism. But we're hoping in the next year to start actually formally uh, searching for um, sponsors because it costs, NASA's sample return mission is going to cost seven billion US dollars. And we're proposing a mission that will cost one billion US dollars. So I know that sounds like a lot, but it is a cheaper version than the NASA version. Um, so it does cost money to go to space, but we discover so many things and technology expands because we go to space. And so I would say that we need to go to space. So maybe I'll, I'll stop there. You can have another five, 10 minutes if you want. If I want, okay. Well, those are the, I mean, those are the basic things. The only, maybe the only other thing I would like to mention is, um, is that something that I really hope that my students learn and that I think is really important and it was important in my own career is that we are making observations as scientists, and then we are also working with um, philosophers who ask the question, can we even define life? And the engineers who are like, okay, let's go build something to go look for it. So we have all these different people contributing to all of this, but I think one of the really important things is that when you're, especially, and I try to get this across to students, no matter what you're doing, when you're making observations or thinking about things, it's really important to um, at least in my case, to look for the things that are uh, that don't quite match or don't quite fit. And my own discoveries, discovery science, is all about really uh, 
noticing, you know, learning your basics and then going out and observing. And if you can't explain something, then go out into another field and maybe there's the answer. And in my own work, it turned out that the zoologists actually led me to my career. If I, I wouldn't be here today if it weren't for zoologists. And I was a geologist trying to learn more about life, and I didn't understand some rocks I was working on, which turned out to be a new kind of extreme environment. And I was only a master's student. I had no idea what to do with this information. But luckily, I had great mentors who then said, go and make more observations. Go and ask more questions. Here's a new paradigm. And um, so that's something that I really think has to be infused in any kind of exploration that you do. So that's the kind of thing that we're trying to. And we've got art students who are saying to me, how do I work in space? And the engineers are like, how do I get a job in space? And um, I think we have to create it as we go. And I believe New Zealand will, as usual, lead the way. Small country, but really big, big gains because um, it's phenomenal. There are at least 120 companies now chasing what Rocket Lab does, which was a whole new model. And so, um, I don't know, I'm pretty inspired. I thought I was going to train and work in the US, and then we ended up here almost by accident. And we were going to hang out for three years and just check it out. And of course, now I have an almost 17 year old here. And uh, we've been here a long time. And I feel like the opportunities here are phenomenal. Whereas there isn't a lot of money, there's a lot of opportunity to be creative and, um, and go for your life, really. So we're going to Mars. We're planning to anyway. And if we do, we'll bring all the schools with us. We have a whole plan for a whole program with the schools, getting rope schools to drive rovers. And uh, that's our idea. That's my dream. I hope I get it. And we get it um, before I retire. <laughs> but even after that, I'm sure I'll keep working on it. So that's a little bit about what we're doing and uh, a little bit about some of the reason that I think we need to go look for life somewhere else. I think we really want to ask the big questions. Can I speak to you? Yes. <laughs> Uh, life as you uh, define it is what we experience on Earth at the moment. Is it possible there is life totally separate from what we understand as, as life? Yes, so the question is, is it possible that there's other life besides the life as we know it? We, we start with what we know because otherwise we're really grasping in the dark. But in fact, there are lots of people working on what they call agnostic biosignatures, which just is a fancy word for, well, how would we step back enough to be able to understand some kind of pattern that isn't life, but isn't birth life? So the answer is there's lots of people working on that. Possibly. Yeah. Yes, so the answer is yes, maybe. <laughs> I mean, there might be other dimensions too, and multiverses, and I'm sure there's been somebody here who's talked to you guys about that. So that's something that would keep me awake at night. I don't think I could be a cosmologist. <laughs> <laughs> There's a question here. Yeah. Is, um, I, I just wanted to remind some people who've been coming to these cafes for a long time, longer than Scott's been around, that uh, about uh, ten or more years ago, Peter Beck, oh, who was starting this business, wow, gave a, a, a cafe to us. Did he really? Yes. I mean, he got uh, he got a museum medal. Uh, yes, award, he did. And, um, I saw that. I was happy to talk to him and remind him of the time he came here, which yeah. he said was actually very important in, in inspiring him to keep going. I think so. When you're starting out, um, we asked, so there's a guy, the guy who did the Spirit Rovers, Spirit and Opportunity Rovers, were the twin rover missions in the 2000s, and this is Stephen Squires, who was at Cornell University, and he just he said to us, because we said, what do we do? How do we get this mission? We know it's the best science. In fact, at the Mars sample return meetings at in NASA, at Jet Propulsion Lab, JPL, there's no doubt that our mission proposal was the best scientifically. But NASA really wanted to go somewhere new. I mean, how do you tell the American public you're going to spend $7 billion and you've already been to this spot? Why didn't you, you know, figure it out when you were over there? <laughs> so, uh, anyway, Stephen Squires, so we asked him, how do we get this mission? Because we know scientifically it's the real question of, is there life on Mars? Because life is in hot springs on Earth, like, you cannot avoid it. And so there are these, these weird finger-like things made out of silica that are in a hot spring environment on Mars, but three and a half billion years old, so fossil, dead. And there's volcanoes all around, so it's clear it's the same setting. It doesn't even matter if we don't find life there. You should find life there. Life should have started on Mars just like it should have started on Earth. And it didn't. So Stephen Squire said to us, just don't give up. You know, do really great science and, and stick with it. And I think that's certainly what Peter Beck had to have done because everybody told him that what he was trying to do was impossible. 
And, uh, I didn't tell them. They answered quite to the contrary. <laughs> Right, but a lot of, in, you know, his investing is mostly from offshore, it's not from New Zealand. So, um, yeah, so we're, we know the science is fantastic, the students are over the moon about it. In fact, I've got 225 of them writing a Mars mission sample return uh, proposal right now, and they'll be handing that in by the end of the semester. So maybe we can get some new ideas from the students. I'm, I'm totally open to that. Especially the engineers, I'm sure they'll figure out. The, the rave right now are drones. Everybody wants to send a drone somewhere. So Titan, which is in Sat which is Saturn's moon, and that's the one full of haze. It's full of hydrocarbons, which is not the same as life, but those are those ring-like structures with carbon and hydrogen and oxygen. So ethane and propane and all that. And it rains liquid methane, and there are methane lakes. So they want to go there, and they have a mission called the Dragonfly mission that will be going, and it's all a drone mission. They're going to be flying around Titan, and it, there's a funded Marsden Royal Society project at the University of Otago. Um, I'm the chair of the Earth Science and Astronomy panel of Marsden, so we give away you know, six to nine million dollars in our area every year, and last year we gave out money for them to study the cyanide, the link between cyanide and prebiotic chemistry, and there's loads of cyanide and the Dragonfly mission. So we've got people working in planetary science here in New Zealand. And I just wanted to say to you that I think it's essential that we do this. And it's new. I mean, I hadn't heard much about any of this. I've been here 25 years. And now we're finally really talking about planetary science here. Um, and I think we should be players. Why not? You know, there's a lot of smart people who really want to get involved. And I don't mean just scientists. There's going to be space policy, space law, the idea of planetary protection, both towards the planet that you're going to and coming back to Earth and not contaminating Earth. So there are a lot of things that we need to work on. So that's my, my, um, my pitch for why it's so important that New Zealand's involved with um, space science, basically. Cool, so we'll take a pause here. We'll pause for about five minutes, give people a chance to refill your drinks, think of all the really good questions that you've got, allow Kathy to eat a little bit more of her dinner. Um, and we'll come back at just before 10 past. So, but before we do that, if everyone can thank our lovely speaker.